And yet many times that's how our churches are summarized. That's the idea or the picture that people get of us is they know what we're not allowed to do. They know what we're against, but they don't really know what our mission is. So we're left with the question, okay then, what are we called to do? What are we actually for? Because your faith and your religion, they should not be summed up by warming seats in a church and private devotion alone. There's more to it than that. There's more to it than just being here. There's more to it than just being here when there's not something better to do. There's more to it than just keeping your faith private and not actually going out and employing it and putting it to use. Faith is a currency. It's not meant to be hoarded. It's meant to be spent. You're meant to get a return on it. It's like burying the talents. And what I've recognized, and and many of you may be familiar with these statistics, but the Christian church in America is losing two groups of people at a rate that is way too rapid. And those two groups are these. The first one is men. And the second one is the next generation. It's young people. If you look at the statistics, women surpass men in every single meaningful, spiritual, and religious poll in the Protestant church. Every one of them across the board. Church attendance, time reading the Bible, time in prayer, ministry involvement, even profession of faith. Now, you know, I guess (laughs) ideally it would all be like 100 and 100, right? Like I'm not necessarily like competing with one or the other. But what I want you to realize is that we are losing a group. It didn't used to always be that way, but it is today. Men do not feel like they belong or fit in to the church's mission for whatever reason, or else they would be here, right? And young people are finding inspiration elsewhere. They're being more inspired by other movements, other groups, And they're not finding it here. So Jesus hasn't changed. The Bible hasn't changed. What did? I believe we stopped inspiring people. I believe we stopped inspiring people and calling them to more. I think that we started summing up people's faith and their religious experience by simply being inside four walls and sitting in a chair and taking up space that we didn't create opportunities outside of a church staff for people to be involved and feel like they have a part. I believe Jesus inspired people. We don't have to look any further than Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 through 20, and it says this. While walking by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea, for they were fishermen. So these were men, right? These were manly men. These were fishermen. They got out and they worked with their hands and the sweat of their brow and and all those things. And it says that Jesus said to them, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. That's kind of challenging, isn't it? That's pretty inspiring. That's calling you to more than you're already experiencing. And in verse 20, it says, immediately they left their nets and followed him. Jesus didn't start by calling out their sins. He didn't start by telling them what they shouldn't do. He didn't start by telling them all the things they needed to oppose and be against. Instead, he called them to something greater. And I believe that we would see men And I believe we would see the next generation respond if we did a better job of calling them to something greater. Painting a picture, parents, adults, leaders, showing them an example of what it looks like to live for something greater. Showing them that there is more than just being at church or coming to church when there's not something better to do. Showing them that there's more to it than just keeping your faith private and saying, well, it's just between me and God. It doesn't really concern anybody else. But showing them what it means to have big, bold, audacious faith. How often do we pray prayers 
that require God. And without him, they are impossible. I believe many of our very own prayers are uninspiring. Like, I know that God is never actually backed into a corner. Like, I know that we can never ask anything that's too big for him. But I like to think, and this is just me, I like to think that sometimes we pray prayers and God's like, oh, yeah, that's a good one right there. Man, that's a, that's, that's, that's a, that's a big one. I think that sometimes we can move the needle a little bit with the way that we pray, and not only that, but the way that we live our lives. And if we could learn how to model that to a next generation, I believe that we wouldn't see people defect from the faith and from the church when they turn 18 years old, because that's what we're seeing. They're they're finding something that's more inspiring, something that's more convincing, they, they find a, a professor at a college somewhere who can argue a little bit better, and because they are still biblically illiterate, or because they haven't had a real, authentic experience with God via their relationship with him. Because let me tell you something, you cannot talk me out of an experience. If I see it, if I feel it, if I taste it, if I smell it, if I'm there and I lay my own eyes on it, I don't care how good you can argue. I don't care how much you know. I don't care how convincing you can be. I don't care how inspiring you are. You cannot talk me out of an experience. I might not be able to tell you how it happened, why it happened, or how it's possible. But if I actually experienced it, You can never talk me out of it. You can never convince me otherwise. And if we continue to lead these quiet, boring, passive lives, and we don't really get out there, and like like we 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 like the song Oceans, right? Becky kills that song. You know, take me deeper where my faith is without borders. We don't live that. We sing it. It sounds good. It looks good up on the screen. But how often are we really living it? How often are we really getting into deep waters? I don't think it's very often. And if we will model that and lead our young people into having those real experiences and those real encounters, I don't care who talks to them. You will not be able to convince them otherwise. You will not be able to talk them out of their faith. You will not be able, they will not grow up and and age out and defect from from church. They will be so bought in, so inspired. Jesus called them to something greater. And what I want to do is I want to call everyone to something greater. But specifically, I want to call men in the next generation to something greater. Because that's where we're lacking. That's where our weakness is. You're only as strong as your weakest link. You know, as I was reading Matthew chapter 4, I was like, imagine if they had been hunters. (laughs) Jesus said, I'll make you hunters of men. (laughs) My point is, how often do we ever do or say anything or model anything in our churches that make people go, whoa, what's going on there? You know, they say where there's smoke, there's fire. How many times do people look at the church and see smoke and say, man, there's a lot of, I don't know what's going on over there, but there's, there's, there's a lot of movement. There's a lot of stuff happening. There's a, there's a lot of noise and, and it draws people in. I don't want to go quietly into the night. I believe all the inspiration that we need for today is given to us in the very first commandment that God gave us. It's in Genesis chapter 1. I want to read verses 26 and 28. It says, Then God said, Let us make man in our image after our likeness. In verse 28, And God blessed them, and God said to them, Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it. Many of you know Zoe and I are doing our part to try to multiply and fill the earth, okay? (laughs) We welcomed Miss L. James into the world at 3.51 a.m. on September 2nd, uh, eight ounces, 20 and a half inches long, and we're blessed to have a healthy baby and a healthy mama. Um, Sleep is another subject entirely, but we are blessed to have a healthy baby and a healthy mama. 
And listen, church, that's part of it, okay? That is part of it. But there's more to it than that. Look, some of y'all, y'all are like, I got that part down. In fact, I got too much of a head start on the whole filling the earth thing. But what about that last part? Subdue the earth? What, what, what does that mean? Be fruitful, multiply, fill it. You're like, okay, yeah, I, I, I kind of get that. And then that last part, and subdue the earth. Man, that's kind of, that sounds kind of good, doesn't it? Like, like if you're, if you're a, a man and you've got even a little bit of testosterone and you hear someone go, subdue the earth, you're like, okay, all right, subdue the earth, yeah. That sounds like something I would like to, I'd like to know more about that. <laughs> I, that might be something I would like to be involved in. And, and I looked up the definition of the word subdue, to, to subdue the earth. And it means to conquer, to bring into subjection, to bring under control, especially by an exertion of the will. Could it be that this is what Paul was talking about in Romans chapter 8, verse 37? He said, no, in all these things, we are more than conquerors in him who loved us. We're, we're called to conquer. We're called to win. We're called to wage war. We're called to put forth effort. And the amazing thing, the inspiring thing about all of that is that our possibilities are endless. Like, how do you put a lid on subdue the earth? Where does it stop? When, when have you gone, okay, we did it, subdued the earth? No, like I think it's something that, that just goes on and on and on and on and, 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 and never really stops. We're not just meant to be seat warmers at a church. We're not meant to be prayer warriors who never leave the prayer closet. We're called to get out there. We're called to, why, why would God give us armor if we're supposed to hide all the time, why would he give us a sword if he never thinks that we're going to swing it or use it because it looks good? Look, I know a lot of y'all got guns and you got gun safes, hopefully, and, and, and everyone knows what a safe queen is. Y'all know what a safe queen is? It's a gun that never sees the light of day. That thing just stays in the safe. It's in the nice little box. It's put over there on its shelf. There's a nice little box of ammo, but you, but you never shoot it because you're like, value will go down. <laughs> it might get a scratch on it. This one is like, we make fun of, of, of our wives because they have couches you're not supposed to sit on and pillows you're not supposed to put your head on. And we like to, oh, ha, ha, that's so funny. And towels we don't get to use. It's like, these towels are for looking at. These towels are for using. And, and we're such hypocrites because we have safe queens. <laughs> we have guns. We go, no, 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 no. Th th let's just leave this one where it is. And my point is, many of us are doing that with the armor of God. We're just staying on the back lines. We're just sort of onlookers. We're not really in the fight. We're not really in the battle. We're kind of one foot in, one foot out. And, and, and then we get this idea that that's the summary of our faith, that it's kind of lukewarm, it's kind of boring, it's kind of uninspiring, it's kind of quiet, it's kind of passive. We just go to our little coffee shops and, and read our Bibles, and we go to this little secret room we have, and we get on our knees and pray, and we come in church, and we just take up this little spot right here. And for most of y'all, it's the same spot. Most of y'all don't know what to do when someone's in your spot, and you're like, that's my spot. You know, and you move over a little bit, and, 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 and this is all we occupy. And yet God is saying, go be fruitful, go multiply, go fill the earth, and subdue the earth. That is inspiring. That's something that will win over the next generation. That's something that will get men fired up and back in church. The Bible tells us if we will humble ourselves, get on our knees and pray, repent and turn from our wicked ways, God will heal our land. That's a challenge. 
That's, that's inspiring. That gets me fired up. Even on the limited amount of sleep I had last night, that gets me excited. No good man backs down from a good challenge. I think we're just not doing a good enough job challenging. And I don't think it's because it's not in God's word. You know, you had Peter, right? Who denied Christ three times. And then Peter gets filled with the Holy Spirit and he goes out and he preaches and it says 3,000 are saved and added to the church that day. A thousand people for each time he denied Christ. Now, we see this transformation that takes place. But many of you may not know this. Basically, all the disciples were martyrs. They, they led lives that were, that were loud and, and got a lot of attention. And ultimately, for some of them, that led to them having a brutal ending. But what's interesting to me about Peter is he was going to be crucified. And you know what his last request was? And, and I'm just going to tell you, this is, this is one of the most gangster things I've ever read. He says, I know I'm going to be crucified. I know my time's come. I'm, I'm summarizing. I'm giving you the, the Cody English Standard Version. But he said, would you crucify me upside down? He said, because I'm not worthy to die the same way my Savior did. That's inspiring. That's the request of a man who was gripped by something so much bigger than himself. That even in his last breath, even when all he was supposed to do was die, he still found a way to make it about Jesus. He still found a way to honor his Lord. My prayer and my hope for all people, for all men, for all women, for all of this next generation is that they will become gripped by something so much greater than them that even if they wanted to let go, it wouldn't let go of them. I pray that you have experiences, encounters, and I hope that even when you go through the fires and the trials and tribulations of this life, that it just produces a faith more precious than gold. That we don't have people turn away from the church because we realize that God is with us in green pastures, but he's also with us in the valley of the shadow of death, for I'll fear no evil. I hope that we're people who do our best to subdue the earth, whatever that looks like, whatever that sounds like. That's inspiring. And that's the type of culture that we desire here at Liberty Hill. I want that to be our culture. I want that to be our DNA. We say that our mission, and this comes from, from the Great Commission, but our mission is to help people become fully devoted followers of Jesus. That's why we're here. That's why we exist. We all want to become more fully devoted followers of Jesus. And we know our, our four steps to do that, right? Right? Know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. Know God, find freedom, discover purpose, make a difference. And we have seven core values. Many of you may not know these. We probably haven't done a good enough job talking about them, but I want to share them with you. Seven core values that I believe reflect our mission and our vision for our church. The first one is intercessory prayer. We rely on private and corporate prayer in conception, planning, and execution of all the ministries and activities of our church. Guys, without prayer, we are powerless. We will never subdue anything without God's power. And the way that we get that is through prayer. The second thing is this. So first one is intercessory prayer. The second one is reaching lost people. We value the unchurched. We don't just value the people that are here in this room right now. We value the people out there who don't know anything about us or anything about our God. Lost people. And we'll use every available Christ-honoring means to pursue, win, and disciple them. Look, we want to multiply and fill the earth, 
but we also want to multiply and fill heaven with born-again believers. The third one is this, authentic worship. We desire to acknowledge God's supreme value and worth in our personal lives in corporate contemporary worship of our church. Here's what that means. Everything revolves around him. Everything. We can't afford to make this about ourselves. We have to make it about him in every single thing that we do. And one of the ways that we do that is through authentic worship. The fourth one is this, a mobilized congregation. Look, we seek to equip all of our uniquely designed and gifted people to effectively accomplish the work of ministry. We're not built on the talents of a few people. We're not built on what a church staff does in their nine to five. We are built on the sacrifices of every single member of the body of Christ. And if anyone lacks, then the whole body lacks. The fifth one is this, it's family. We support the spiritual nurture of the family as one of God's dynamic means to perpetuate the Christian faith. We focus on marriages for this reason, and we focus on the next generation for this reason. It is God's design. It's how he made it. The church, student ministry, kids ministry, Bible studies, small groups, all these things that, that we offer here at Liberty Hill, and I know I'm not even naming them all because there's like so many of them now, but these are not meant to substitute your own faith. Parents, it's not meant to take your place. It can't take your place. This is just meant to supplement what you are already doing, what you're already doing in your own private life, what you're already doing in your own private devotion with your family. We're trying to come alongside of you. We can't replace you. We just want to reinforce you. The sixth one is this. It's ministry excellence. Since God gave us his best and our Savior, Jesus, his only begotten son, we seek to honor him by maintaining the same high standard of excellence in all our ministry activities. Easy way to sum this up is we won't settle. We won't settle for anything other than our best. We're not perfectionists because we can never be perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. We worship him. We don't worship ourselves. But we won't settle for anything other than putting our best foot forward, anything other than bringing him our best, our first fruit, our highest. And the seventh one is this. Worship team, y'all can join me back up here. The seventh one is this. We, we seek to have a sense of community. We ask all of our people to commit and fully participate in a biblically functioning church where we can reach the lost, exercise our gifts, be shepherded, and grow in being more and more Christ-like. You know what this means? It means we're better together. We truly are. We're not meant to live in isolation. We're not meant to bear our burdens alone. First and foremost, we're meant to, to bring our burdens and our weight and our struggles and our pain and our shame, our guilt, our condemnation, our weakness. We're meant to put them on Jesus. We know that we confess our sins to Jesus in order that we might be forgiven. But in the book of James, it's so interesting to me that he says, confess your sins to one another that you might be healed. There's healing in this. I know that every single one of you, I could hand you a microphone and you could, you could give me an instance of church hurt. And if not, just hang around a little while and, and you'll have a story. Look, this is God's church, and God is perfect, but it's filled with sinful people. It's bound to happen. But that doesn't stop us. That doesn't deter us from the fact that there is supposed to be healing in this. Confess your sins to Jesus. You're forgiven. James says, confess them to one another that you might be healed. There's healing when we bear our burdens along with one another. There's healing when we pray together. There's healing when iron sharpens iron. There's, there's healing in this place. And we'll go further, faster together. We will do more. We will see more. 
we will accomplish more together than we ever would alone. It's, it's about the journey. More so than the destination. I'm excited for the things that we're going to see and we're going to do and we're going to experience. I'm excited for where we're going, but I really love where we're at now. I really love the people we have right now. I can't wait to see the new families. I can't wait to see the new faces. I can't wait to see people kneeling down and giving their lives to Jesus. I can't wait to see more and more people baptized and go public with their faith. I can't wait. But I'm not ever going to look past where we are right now because I'm thankful for where we are. I'm thankful for the people we have. I'm thankful for the things that we're doing. It's about the journey. It's about being together. And I believe that that'll inspire new people and families. And this is my hope, and it sounds a little strange, but I hope you hear my heart. I hope that many people become uncomfortable. Uncomfortable if you don't maintain the culture or key values here at Liberty Hill Church. I hope that you feel uncomfortable. If you're not generous, I hope you feel like you don't fit in because I hope we're all overwhelmingly generous and it's not who we are to not be generous. If you're not a passionate worshiper, whatever that looks like, it doesn't have to look like me, it doesn't have to look like anyone up here. If you're not a passionate worshiper, I hope you feel uncomfortable. If you're not serving or getting involved, I hope you feel out of place. If your heart is not for reaching lost people, I hope you feel like you're going in the wrong direction because you feel the friction of everyone else. Found people, find people. That's what we do. If you are a disciple of Jesus, you will multiply yourself. Find me one disciple in all of the Bible who did not multiply, and I'll retract that. Disciples multiply. We are called to multiply. And saved people serve people. When you are saved and you've really given your life to Jesus, you will have a desire to serve other people. And I believe that if we will commit ourselves to these things, that we will reach 200 people in 2024. I know I mentioned that a while back. I, I haven't forgotten about it. I haven't given up on it. I'm still believing. I'm still pushing. And I believe that if we can all be consistent and commit and devote ourselves, that we will see that happen. Why? Because healthy things grow. And another reason is because we cannot do it without you. Not only that, we don't want to do it without you. <laughs>